with the body and paintwork complete, the engine running and ready to install, our 1968 Plymouth Roadrunner is a month away from going home. Wait a minute, we haven't even introduced this car. All right, let's take it from the top. They're coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. Joined by his out of this world cousin Dougie. Oh, hi, Mark. His apprentice and daughter, Alyssa. Whoa, whoa, stop. And his childhood best friend, Royal. Mark hates everybody. His protege painter, Will Scott. You got one job. This is Graveyard Cars. I'm Stan Curtis. Uh, this is my father, Jack Curtis. So a few years ago, I got a phone call from the Curtises. They had a 1968 Plymouth Roadrunner that had been in their family forever. It had also been setting out back in the weeds forever. And, you know, life gets in the way, so sometimes it's a pecking order, right? A car isn't always at the top of the pecking order. I had three small children, so I go down and I spot this Roadrunner. And the first thing I spotted was the four speed with a straight seat. And I'm thinking, I think that'll work. It was a durable car, very durable. And my family just loved it. Now, when I first looked at the pictures, I realized that it was a rough car. I realized it was gonna have a lot more rust than what showed up in the pictures. We live in the country, and he basically parked it. When they tell me it's been setting there for that many years, I know that the floors are rotten. I know that there's a chance frame rails are rotten, quarter panels, wheelhouses, rear body panel. I know what I'm in for. But when I hear the story of the Curtises, it motivates me to bring this car back to life. When I was three years old, I remember him pulling up in the driveway and beeping the horn. And uh, I knew that was a familiar sound, so I remember going out into the uh, yard and him and my brother were out there and he had just pulled up in that Roadrunner. It had like a, a roar to the backup and then you could hit the horn and everybody recognized it wherever we would go. <laughs> I didn't know any of my friends or relatives that actually had a cartoon on their car. <laughs> and, and I thought that was really neat about it. In 1968, when Plymouth had the idea for the Roadrunner, they needed to get permission from Warner Brothers to use that character. Warner Brothers did bless them to use the Roadrunner character in the name, but they couldn't use the full color version. I don't think Warner Brothers was on board yet exactly. They said, yes, you can use the black and white version, you can't use the full colorized version. That's why, like, even on the Curtis's car, the black and white Roadrunner bird will be installed because that's correct for 68. I think everybody was talking muscle cars then. I knew when I bought that car that I'd never get rid of it. In 1969, the car just took off. It became Motor Trans Car of the Year. It was the most sold muscle car in Mopar's history at that time. Warner Brothers moved to the next level, gave them a full blessing to put the full colorized version. As well as, one little tidbit, the horn in 1968, because of this same rule, was black, and the character was black that said Voice of the Roadrunner. In 69, you got a purple horn, the famous purple horn, and a fully colorized decal. And over the years, there'd be people come by and say, look, I'd like to buy that car. And my father wouldn't sell it because he was afraid we would be disappointed. I wanted to make sure that at some point, uh, it could sort of have some of its glory, uh, of its glory years, of, of what it would look like when it was first new, exactly the way it was when it came out of the factory. Graveyard cars, a lot of the things I'd always had questions about for Mopars was he was throwing off these numbers and these letters and what all of these different options were in the car. One of the things Mr. Curtis had shared with me that I took total compliment on was that he likes the show primarily because he gets to learn something. He knew about cars and he knew a little bit about the Roadrunner, but he says the way that we educate you. I'd never seen a program that broke it down to that specifics of what these cars were built and how they come from the factory and what the build sheets would say. 
and I was trying to find out what is really did this car from the factory, and then what at the dealership did they put some kind of dealer option on it that I may not have known about. The way that we talk about the nuts and the bolts and the fasteners and what's correct and what's not and what numbers are right and what ones aren't, that's the stuff he really sinks his teeth into. I watched this show and I come to find out Mark, and I'm kind of blowing smoke, but, but he's good at it. The best. And that's just my opinion, but I think it's a pretty good one. <laughs> is he looking behind? <laughs> so this process is just like any other one. The car comes in, we put it on a bin pack inside the shop, get it up in the air, disassemble the whole car, and then at that point, market inventory, what we have, what we don't have. If we do have this part, is it savable or we're gonna have to replace it? So he does a, man, a three or four page list on each car just before we tear it apart and then through that whole process. Once that's done, you know, everything is labeled, put away in a bin. So that way, you know, when it comes time to assemble it, we got everything right where Mark left it. But after the disassembly is all wrapped up, it heads out to the dipper. And that's when you really find out what you have. The car comes back from the dipper and either you're gonna have a really solid car, it's gonna go quick, or you're gonna have a car that needs everything. This car wasn't too bad. You know, the normal quarters, trunk floor here or there, but nothing extensive. So when it got back from the dipper, we were able to get DP90 on it, get it right to the metal guys, give them their, their time to do all their cut and grind and welding, final fit and finish, get it, the car just perfectly square. Have Mark come out, double check gaps, just because it's good to have them, a second set of eyes on it. Then it heads right out to the Bondo room. So they do their job, get all the body work done, bring it over to me, we prime it, four or five coats, thick coats of primer, then it goes right back to them. They block it out, clean up any issues, kick it right back to me. Double check it, prime it again, and then I'll give it back to them a second time where they'll block it again. And then by that point, you're just literally doing that third coat of primer, just a nice even one or two coats, hold everything down because we're not doing the pre-paints anymore. So these cars really need to be perfect when they come over to me. I was thinking about my kids and my wife, how, how tickled they were gonna be, how much fun it was gonna be, yeah. you know, have it back like it was. The one thing that I'm hoping he can do, and my mother too, is maybe take it to some local parades and some local car shows. We have, uh, we have a lot of uh, car shows that's uh, for charity. I like that. My hope is, is that if he's going to get the morning paper, that he can drive into town, and even if it's just that much, uh, that he can enjoy that. And my mother drove it for a lot of years. I want to make sure that my grandchildren and my brothers and sisters' grandchildren uh, have some memory, uh, have something to look back on in their life uh, that my father, uh, that's related to him. I'm excited. I think y'all are going to do great. And, uh, and I can't hardly wait. <laughs>
Do you want to look in there? It's spraying fuel. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. What's wrong with that? Okay. Ignition's on. Uh -huh. I'll let you push the button. I mean, he likes to push the button. Let's I just sure give do. it. A, let's just give it a try. See what it wants to do. I don't want to die. Is everything <clears throat> tightened down and nice? And this, I can put this back here, so I don't have to take it in the nut. Away okay. from the exhaust. Saw a guy, uh, Johnny Head, back in high school. He was in the shop class, and the battery cable got caught in the fan that whipped up and hit him right in the nut, and he lost one, a nut after that. And uh, so they call him Johnny One Ball. <laughs> Is that true? No. <laughs> Crank it over. Push the button? Sure. You want to turn the ignition on, or you just want to crank it over? <laughs> Makes no difference to me how long you want to be out here, buddy. It's a nice day. It is a nice it's day. It's a beautiful day. Be a good day to be at the coast watching Flicks and Grimms, huh? Mm-hmm. Push I'll the button. I'll explain it later. Once in a great while, we would go down to Granny's place and bring the eight millimeter projector, and we'd watch a movie. And somehow in his mind, something was said out there at that moment that he changed Granny to Grimm's, which we never called her Grimm's. I don't know why we would call her Grimm's. And then Flicks makes sense, because that's a movie. Flicks and Grimm's. Push uh, the button. What? Yeah, no. sure. No, you go ahead. Go ahead, try it. Pushing the button. Oh, God. OK. Me too. <laughs> Stay back. <laughs> So when you start up an engine for the first time, there's a multitude of adjustments that have to be made at the very same time. Sometimes you have to bump the timing up. Sometimes you have to open or close the choke or pump the throttle. You have to figure out if you're getting fuel to it. Is the compression built up yet? All these things. So the initial fire up can be a little bit rough. Now what you'll notice is once they do start up and that roughness begins to go away, the engine begins to idle faster. It begins to clear its throat, so to speak. So once that engine begins to clear out and start running right, you can step back, walk around it, do your QC stuff. First thing I always look for is oil leaks. Choke slam and shut. Oh, that's why. Okay. Can you disconnect it? We'll have to adjust that. Sounds good, right yes, off the bat. Right. That's not a pre-start, no gain. And you can see the paint's not burned off the manifold. You see that? Paint's not burned off the manifold, look at that. That's an initial startup right there, no smoke yet. Got a little bit noisy valve train, which is normal on a new engine. We're gonna hold the RPM up so the cam can break in. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> another engine down and another engine down. Love it, love it. All right, we have the engine running exactly the way it's supposed to. No leaks, no rattles, no knocks. It is complete. So right now, where we're at is that drivetrain is finished and ready to go into the car. So as soon as Will gets that car over here from the paint shop, we can reunite them, put the wheels and tires on it, make it a roller, and it's gonna be really close to going back to the owners. Hey ghouls, back in season 10, episode 13, we finished The Little Dead Wagon. We premiered it at the SEMA show. It was a 426 Hemi. What transmission did it have behind it? Was it a 727 torque flight, four speed manual, Silver Sport A41? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, folks, how did we do on that one? Our little dead wagon with the big old Hemi in it. What transmission was behind it? If you set the 727 Torque Flight, congratulations, good job. You got it exactly right and you were paying attention. We took a 727 Torque Flight out of a four wheel drive truck, had it completely polished and rebuilt down at Monster Transmission. We also customized a pistol grip shifter to work on the automatic transmission. If that wasn't enough, we did custom wood floors, Kreger wheels, Hoosier 33-inch drag slicks, 
a nine inch Ford housing with a 489 Mosier pig unit and all of the lettering was not decals. It was hand painted on just like the old days by Brenda Kellerson. Today, Justin and I are installing the decal on the 1969 Charger of Daytona. I did mean to ask him if you, you've done one of these or you haven't? I haven't done one. I've Your just been around did. with my dad. He, he'd paint them on there. He painted his on. Yeah. Yeah, no chance of getting a bubble in that. That's a lot easier, actually. Yeah. <laughs> now, keep in mind when you're talking about vinyl graphics or painted on stripes, it is not an assembly line process. It is not manufacturing that does it. It is not automated. It's all a human being doing it. Unfortunately, it's not factory, so we're going to do it this way. It's the perfect day for it. It's raining cats and dogs, middle of winter in, in Oregon. There's nowhere I'd rather be than in this shop <laughs> out of the weather. Oh, yeah. So that means there's room for error. There's also room for variance. That's why before I disassemble a car, if it has an original decal on it, I document the heck out of that. I make sure that I have all the measurements from the back of the panel to the leading edge of the decal to the back edge of the decal. Where does it lie in space for the side marker light? I document all those so that when I'm putting it back together again, good, bad, right or wrong, I can put it back exactly the way it started life. And that's our goal, is to put them back exactly the way they started life. We've got to make sure that we know where this decal goes in space. Make a mark, we won't put it on yet. Just make a mark where it goes in space so we can put the deck lid one on first. The deck lid has to go on first so we have the right trajectory coming off of it for the two quarter panel ones. So that's what we're establishing right now. So go ahead and give me one at one inch. I want the, yeah, that end of it at one inch, perfect. Great. So that's not bad for what we're doing. Okay. Um, that looks right. Yep. Now we don't have much up top here. Okay, for so overhang. you want to come up a little yeah. bit. So here's my tape, and that's right on line at the bottom. That's pretty close right there. Yeah. Okay, so I'm liking that, and I'm liking that. I like that. Now, when it comes to this deck lid decal, there's a few things you have to be mindful of. Number one, the factory did a terrible job. If you look at my original pictures of that, it's it's appalling. I mean, nobody had ever adjusted the deck lid after the fact. You can see that it fit the way it had to fit. But the decal doesn't even match up lengthwise, front to back, from the quarter panel to the trunk lid. And then they're askewed, like maybe a quarter of an inch. I should have put a tape measure on that. I didn't. But it was terrible. That was the mass production. Even though it was still done by hand, it's still considered mass production. They had a short period of time to build over 500 of these cars. That was one of them. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. For what we're needing right now, which is to establish where that goes in space, that's mm -hmm. it. We need to put a piece of tape right where that black graphic goes on there. And that's our measurement. OK. So this piece of tape right here represents where the bottom of the decal is going to go on our deck lid graphic. We'll center it side to side so it has the same amount of overhang on each side. But where it goes strategically, we just need to make sure. So this tape represents the left-hand side. Let's measure from there to there. So really what's important is to make sure that that decal front to back is where it needs to be and that it lines up perfectly with the quarter decals. That way, when you look at it on the side, that entire line and that entire trajectory is the same from side to side. We'll turn this over and tack cloth this. You just want to make sure that all your surfaces are clean. So he's got a tack cloth, the same one they use for painting. Now that we are not doing pre-paints, we seal these cars. So the cars finish off in 400. I use the PPG NCS 2004, it's a gray sealer. It'll feel like 320 scratches, but we finish the car in 400. So I'll do two coats of sealer. And what that does is just any light scratch or any imperfection, a real faint one at this point, that sealer will fill it. So when it comes time for the color, you are literally painting over a, just a perfect finish. When you're doing any type of metallic, the concern is, making sure that your prep work was the best. And if it was off a little, hopefully the sealer got it. Because if you have a 220 scratch, even a 320 scratch, 320 will probably be OK. But if it's not finished off correctly, you'll base it. Everything can look good. You'll clear it. You put it outside, and you'll see a sand scratch. And that's where the metallic lays in that scratch. You could look at the whole side of a car. The metallic just lays out perfect. But where the paper, uh, sandpaper was too coarse, and you didn't get it sanded out good enough, it could lay in there so that metallic could just go down the complete side of the car if it's not prepped right. So once that sealer dries, I like to give it an hour. We can go right to our color. Go 
car's looking good. 69 Charger Daytona, EV2, Hemi Orange, one of 503 built. 440 Magnum, 375 horsepower, 727 torque flight, 323 sure gripper are in. Got numbers off again? Uh, yeah. I do that when I get nervous. Yeah. Don't want to get the backing paper wet. Go ahead and put the solution on there first. It puts the solution on the deck lid. It puts the solution on the deck lid or gets the hose You just couldn't wait to say that. I've been waiting all day. That's why I'm wearing this shirt. <laughs> Don't put the solution on the girl. And he gets mad. Because the girl down the hole won't put the lotion on. Mm -hmm. And then she starts messing with his dog, Precious. Yeah, so who's really the villain in that one? OK, let's take this off. Take your hand and grab it right there in the, not in the field, but on the outside. Now go ahead and wet that down. Does that not go on spray? No. Now do it. Oh, it does. You're doing fine. You're doing, doing fine, Dougie. I'm Dougie. No. I'm Justin. I don't, know Douglas, what's, no. I don't know what's worse. It's, yeah, <laughs> working with me or Dougie, right? No, getting called Oh, which Doug. one's worse, yeah. OK, first thing we're going to do is we're going to line it up right on our tape line. Well, I'm overhanging on this side about okay. three inches. Let's go this way. We'll have to trim it, obviously. Got a nice reveal. Even though our measurement showed one thing, you don't want that decal to be on there askew where maybe it's tighter towards the opening here than the other side. So we know we're about where we need to be. Now we dial it in and make sure that reveal is the same. OK, so what we're going to do is squeegee from the middle out. We'll get this side locked down. Once that side's locked down, We'll lock down the other side. You can see the stuff building up underneath it as I go. OK, go ahead and do your side. These are actually these long flat panels. The hardest thing is just keeping dirt out of it and air bubbles out of it. Oh, yeah. But it's a lot easier to lay out than a quarter that keeps wanting to peel up around the side marker openings yeah. and like the billboards. There. Oh, that billboard was fun. <laughs> Terrible. You get your patience on those. OK, so with that, we've got the decal in place. So we're going to go ahead. We're not going to pull the backing paper off right now. Just going to let that set longer, because when we go to try to peel it up, it's lifting the paper up with it. I'm just going to let that set for a little while. But we can go ahead. We know where it is now, where it goes in space. It's stuck. So we can go ahead and put the quarter decals on it. And then what we'll end up doing, get this one set on there and squeegee it out get the right-hand side set on the squeegee out, and then we'll just let it set overnight, and then tomorrow we'll pull them back off the backing paper, and we should be done. All right, yep, go ahead and set that down there. That's supposed to be at the bottom. I got to come up there, OK? OK, so we got one inch perfectly right there. And our green tape is right there. I can see the edge of it. So that's the bottom of the lettering. Off. OK, so it's got to come back just a hair. Just a hair. OK, check that. A little Maybe bit more. Maybe a hair more. Yeah. Get this stake down by just starting right there. Get that leading edge. You want to get the top of this squeegeed really well. So I got to get this out of there before it's too late. Good. Did it leave any residue? OK, so I'm going to pull down on this. And when I do, I need you to squeegee that corner real nice. Yep. So much easier with two people. <laughs> yeah. Down to that style line. OK, so we got that side on. It just needs to dry overnight. We're going to go ahead and put the passenger side on. And then uh, we'll pick back up with the removal of the backing tape and, and sticking all the edges down. Same as this side as it is on the other. And we're right at one inch. And we got about the same overhang. Yeah. Go ahead and lock it down. OK, so this has been setting all night. And I think everything's got good adhesion. So we're going to pull the backing paper off and start on the trunk lid. And if we can get this off successfully without air bubbles and wrinkles underneath it, we'll Hopefully tag enough. down the edges of it. And once that's <clears> done, we'll move on to the quarter panel decal. So, Because sometimes when you pull that backing paper up, even though it doesn't 
technically lift, mm -hmm. it can pull an air pocket in it. Oh yeah. So that's great. It's looking really good. Yep. It's looking good. Oh. Perfect. Yeah, it's right on it. The decal came out absolutely perfect. Justin is great to work with because he's really growing as an assembly tech. I'm at a point now where I don't even have to be there. I just like to be there. I like to be there for a multitude of reasons. Torturing people is one, practicing some of my new comedy bits, that's another one, but also making sure it gets done right. I think that's somewhere in the priority list. Now that we got the decal done on the Daytona Charger, we're at a point where we can put the spoiler on. Once we put the spoiler on, we can move to the front end of the car. Look at how big that decal is. Yeah. I mean, that's like, they're not, it's not a little badge on the back of it that says Bill's Toyota or something. I mean, this is, this is in your face saying, this is a Daytona, what you gonna do about it, right? This is a Jerry Crandall version of a car right here. What are you gonna do, you? Well, I can't say that anymore, but I guess I can't even bleep the word now because you can see my mouth is, you can see that. Why don't they just pixelate around your mouth? Well, I don't know. Why don't you call the editors and ask them? Well, just tell me I can't say All right, on our 1970 GTX 446 barrel, we've already made the pulls to the outer rocker and a section of the inner rocker. The inner structure for the quarter is also pulled. Now, all of those things are not only pulled out, and you've seen that uh, previously, but we have it all trimmed away to a point where we can come in now, this is the most crucial part of the pull on this, is to be able to clamp right onto the floor where the floor meets the inner rocker and the under seat pan and make a pull directly on that. We're trying to save the under seat pan. So I'm gonna be working with Shane. Shane's gonna make the pulls on it, and you're gonna watch the floor itself come out, and while it's out and under a load stretched out, he's going to do stress relieving. He's gonna hammer that area until it's shaped the way he wants. Then when he lets off of the actual pump itself, it won't go back, it'll stay where it's at. Once that's done, we can go ahead and start building out that inner structure pieces and putting the car back together again. On our 1970 Barracuda tribute car that we've made into a 446 barrel, six speed silver sport car. Met some folks at Little Creek Casino up in Washington a few years ago. It's his wife, Laura, the one that actually commissioned us to do it, had seen a car just like the one we built for when she was just a kid in school. Fell in love with it and wanted us to build a twin to it. And that's where we're at today. This car had suffered some trauma. It had a tree fall across it, caved the roof in. So we had a significant amount of work to do to the roof and the roof inner structure. We had to end up putting quarter panels, floors, main floor, replace those in the car, convert it over to a manual shift so that we could put that Silver Sport six-speed transmission in it. And then the rest is just body and paint work. So today I'm getting ready to bleed the brakes on our 1970 Cuda. We got a new system for it. It's a one-man system, so I can do this all by myself. Makes my job easier, makes everybody else's job easier. I don't have to pull people to come sit up in the car and press a brake pedal for me. From time to time, I'll show you something that we're doing a little bit differently than we've done in the past. If you go back to previous episodes, you'll see us bleeding the brakes out manually on these cars. Because once the system's all together, it's full of air. It has to be bled out. Typically, that's a process of one guy gets up in the car, raise it up on the bin pad. He pumps the brake pedal. That pressurizes the master cylinder to start sending fluid through the system. You crack the little zerts at the end, and then hopefully the air comes out and you have a solid hydraulic system that's ready to work. It can take time to do that, but it does work. It's just a two-man job and it takes time. So what I wanted to do is speed that process up. So I bought a pressure bleeder for it and I bought an adapter kit. Now what this allows me to do is to pressure bleed the system with just one person and know that you're getting all the air out of it the first time. So the way the pressure bleeder works, it's a reservoir with a pump and it's filled with brake fluid. Now it runs up the lines that you connect and goes into the master cylinder itself. It presses right down, these two fittings press right down on the openings in the master cylinder for the primary and the secondary, the brakes in the front and the brakes in the back. And it just continually puts fluid in there. 
So because now you have this constant flow of brake fluid, no chance of introducing air into the system, you get a constant movement of fluid out of that master cylinder. So we can bench bleed it like we did, comes out of the master cylinder, up over the tubes and down into the cup. You could fill that cup up until the reservoir on the ground was empty. Be no reason to. All you're trying to do is bench bleed it and get the little bit of air that's in the master cylinder out before you bolt it on the car. Okay, so he's made the pull in the main area, the first area of damage, so he's just gonna slide the clamp down now and make another pull towards the back. He just has to work his way up and down that rocker and make the pulls, because one pull won't do it. Okay, so he's got it pulled out to where it needs to be for the most part. He's got some more trimming to do. That last rip was the inner rocker that we're replacing. That's why he was pulling on it, because it's sacrificial. But that really came out nice. That's frame rack, my friends. Let's double check your alignment on their ports down below in the bottom of the master cylinder. They're tight, chain is tight. We can connect our brake line feed coupler. It's connected there. Now we can lift this thing up in the air. Once the master cylinder is bolted on the car, there's a series of adapters to make sure that it's a tight fit. You make all those connections, tighten it down, connect your hose from the reservoir into that adapter, and you're ready to begin bleeding. So once you're all pressurized, all the fluids in the system, you want to go to the back of the car, furthest point away from the master cylinder, and begin bleeding. Pressurized system, all you do is crack that bleeder valve until you have solid fluid coming out. Then close it. Go to the left rear, crack the valve, solid fluid, close it. Lather, rinse, and repeat. So the CUDA's brakes are bled, they're done. The new system worked out perfect. I couldn't be happier. Now that that is done, we can get this car ready for the initial fire up and then ready for alignment. That QQ1, it's a very bright blue metallic, pretty color. It's a little bit darker than B5, but there's no pre-paint, so you just don't go in there and throw a couple coats on and you're done. As far as transparency goes, every car is different, but in these blues, I have noticed the blues and the greens, they take that seven to eight coats to get complete coverage. So I have to go back to doing spray out cards. So that spray out card has four different variations of colors that you could potentially be painting over. So you do that spray out card and you cover it, you hold it up to a light until you can't see through that card anymore. Once you have your coverage on that, you know that's exactly how many coats you need on the car. And because you've sealed it, you know you don't have any small imperfections, sand scratches, any issues, pinholes, stuff like that, because you'll see that in the sealer. So you can go in at, there, at this point, put in seven, eight coats of this color, because it is a transparent color. Let that just dry. Give it time, let it dry, then we're ready to clear it. I prefer just to paint it once, uh, not doing the pre-paint at all. It does require more time to make sure the car's perfect, but because right now, until they get mad and quit, I have two or three helpers. So we have the time to put that in. My preference, just do a final paint and be done. Now, one of the things that was so important to Laura when we built this car was that it had a big camshaft. She liked the rumble of the cam. She remembered that from the car when she was in school. We built the car with that in mind. We built the engine with that in mind. But we wanted to run a stock engine for the most part. We didn't want to spend a bunch of money on the inside of that engine. We're going to run stock exhaust. Wouldn't make sense. But we wanted to accommodate the camshaft. So the mother thumper camshaft, as I so eloquently put it, I guess Comp came up with it first. I would have came up with it. But it's pretty clever. The mother thumper cam has a high lift and a high duration. So we did have to do some modifications to the cylinder heads and the compression ratio so that at the end, the final compression ratio would be 10 and a quarter to one like the factory 446 barrel engine would be, but it would accommodate this camshaft. So outward and inward, other than the cam and the heads, this is a 100% completely stock F440 HP engine. With that, I'm gonna round up Doug and Justin and we're gonna fire this thing up. So I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't say mother fumble. Right? Uh, Sam Jackson, right? What do Sam Jackson said? It's a mother thumping cam and a mother thumping cuda. Okay, 
So we crank the engine over so we have fuel up to the carburetors, but this is the first time we're powering it off because we're very much believers in just sharing the good, the bad, and the ugly. So usually what happens is no matter how hard we try, the distributor's in 180 degrees out. That's part of our charm, right, Dougie? Yep. And then the other thing is usually the carburetors have sat for years and they like to puke fuel all over the place, catch the car on fire and burn it to the ground. If you saw Omen, that's great. It's like that. But we're going to try it anyway. So, looks like it's got some fuel in it. We've got our remote starter here and the key is on. The transmission is in neutral. Let's see what it wants. So, you're right, just safety. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Hey. Ooh, that's hey. a good sound. Hey. Ooh. No way. No way. Can't be that easy, right? No. Wow. So what we're doing is gonna let that run for probably 10 minutes. You guys won't be there for all of it. But once it's ran for 10, 15 minutes, the cam will be broken. in. Then we can lower the idle down. At that point, we'll go back and listen to the cam in the back. Sounds like a big cam right now. Yeah. Sounds like a huge cam. Okay, we'll be back. Way back in season five of Graveyard Cars, we restored this gorgeous, one of only 56 built, 70 Dodge Charger, 426 Hemi, four speed, all numbers matching cars. True or false, the sales code for the white Bumblebee stripe is V8X. If you think you know the answer, why don't you stay tuned after the break? Come back, and we'll find out together. So we just finished starting it up. I've got the idle set down. Fluid levels are all topped off. Listen to that. Mama Fumble. That sounds you good. You could not tell me that did not sound bitching. Sounds, sounds good. That sounds, sounds really good. good. I'm gonna, bitching, huh? I'm going to give it a little RPM. OK. Give it a little R. Music to the ears. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. There you go. How's it sound? Oh, perfect. Absolutely beautiful. That is the cam I want to put in all our engines. You're up at the gut. It's Saturday night. You're cruising along in an FJ 570 Cuda 446 barrel. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. That. With a mother right. thumping cam. A mother thumper? Mother thumper. Yeah. And you're gonna go back to your mother thumping house. Yeah, my house. And do what? And that's where it gets edited. <laughs> Everybody knows that I love to have fun. Uh, especially when, like, I get an initial engine fire up, I get a little crazy. A lot of people don't like my dancing, so I've cut a little bit of it back. But I still like to cut up and have fun and laugh. The only problem is, it's like in the Bible it says, don't cast your pearl among swine. And I don't mean that bad, but it's like, here's all my best comedy stuff getting wasted on a guy that doesn't pay attention, has the attention span of a flea, and answers his phone in the middle of a set. Mm, mm, mm. Good job, gentlemen. Oh, if you need, if you got a personal phone call and you need to take it, you go ahead. Can you shut this off? Don't let the car, the show, anything get in your way. But I love him, though. You can't help it. You can't pick the people you love. You just end up loving them. <laughs> Look in that camera right there. That one? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's, it's just, there goes the pearl. Your little swine. What? I don't get it. All right, my ghoulish friends, how did we do on that one? True or false, V-A-X is the sales code for the white bumblebee stripe. If you said true, you are wrong, but I threw you a bit of a curveball. I made the mistake of installing a V8X stripe on that car. It was supposed to get a V8W. 
So if you watch the episode, you'll see where I was taking the black tape back off and putting the white tape stripe on. V8W is the sales code for the white Bumblebee stripe on a 1970 Dodge Charger. This car also featured a V1X black vinyl top, A34 410 Dana Super Track Pack, bucket seat C55, and a C16 center console, just to name a few things. When it comes time to clear, I usually don't do them in the same day. So the next day you come in, you're fresh, you're ready to go. Do a good once over on the car, make sure you're actually ready to clear. We use the PPG DCU 2021, which is a polyurethane clear. It's a very thick clear, lays down good, cut and buffs great, holds a great shine, great product from start to finish. That process is a little bit easier, believe it or not. You're just clearing a car. So we do three coats to four coats, give or take on the car, what we're looking at. There has been times where you'll see like a slight little wave in something that you may have missed, and I'll put an extra coat of clear on it just so you can block the clear flatter. But for the most part, it's three coats of clear. Let that sit for a week or two, get, make sure it's cured. And then my new helper is great at cut and buffing. I literally paint these cars and then just give them to him. He does the cut and buff on them from start to finish. They look great, and then they can go right to assembly. With the body and paint work complete, the engine running and ready to install. Our 1968 Plymouth Roadrunner is a month away from going home. So about 12 years ago, uh, I took on a project for Aaron's dad. Aaron Smith is our executive producer. You see his little credit down there in the episodes. He's also the guy that was in quite a few episodes like a couple of seasons ago. Anyway, his dad wanted a GTX. He wanted me to take a sports satellite and make it into a GTX because he had bought, his dad had bought the sports satellite brand new. It meant a lot to them. We ended up taking the 318 out of it and putting a 440 in it out of a 69 Chrysler New Yorker that only had 40,000 miles on it. But I still rebuilt it before we put it in. Did a complete color change on it, made it into a black, real sleek, gorgeous. We did have to put a roof skin on it because the original roof skin had rotted out, which happens a lot of times on these cars when they have vinyl tops on them and they don't get addressed in time. So we ended up putting a roof on it, bottoms of the quarters, minimal amount of body work besides that. Once the body work was done, we were able to go through the paint shop, get everything painted, wet sanded, buffed like glass. Then we could put the ornamentation on it. This project took us a few years to do because we kind of piecemealed it. That brings us to where we are today. Mr. Smith asked me to sell the car for him, which I did a few weeks ago, and now it is going home. One of the things that the new owner requested was that everybody from the team sign the inside of the car, which I think is a very flattering considering we're just a bunch of goofball mechanics working around here, but we just happen to have a TV show that I created that everybody said wouldn't happen anyway, so I don't take that for granted either. But anyway, yeah, so we signed the inside of the deck lid and sent it home to him, and I, in fact, I just heard from him, and he's just super thrilled with the car, thought it was absolutely gorgeous, so. If you think it's easy to make a show, Laugher Boy, why don't you make one, okay? You can laugh at my stuff all you want, but until you make your own show, when you have $20 million of your own money on the line, you can do whatever comes in that little AJ idiot head of yours. You know what that's from? I don't think it's 20 million, it's probably two million, but uh, it might be six million. It's, uh, it's Bruce Willis, Armageddon. Oh, yeah. And cut. Cut. <laughs>